Jesus is talking. He says, I do not receive glory from men, but I know that you have not the love of God within you. Jesus tells these Jews that he's talking to that they do not have the love of God inside of them. The Bible says that the count, the carnal mind, the carnal mind is an enemy of God. The Bible says that an unsaved person is an enemy in their mind toward God. And men are by nature God's enemies. If you would ask the average person on the street, are you an enemy of God? They would probably say no. But they are not talking about Almighty God, the God who has revealed Himself in the Bible. They are talking about some God that they have created in their own mind, in their own image, in their own likeness. Because if you were to go down what the Word of God says and ask them how they adhere to that or if they care about adhering to that in their life, you know, if they don't know the Lord, they would say no. And so that's why the Bible says that they are enemies in their mind toward God. Men are by nature actually haters of God. And they prove it by their actions. And they stay that way until God's grace changes them when they are regenerated through Jesus Christ. And very definitely the people that Jesus is talking to right here, they are still God-haters. Look at verse 40. Jesus says, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will him him you will receive. He says, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. Meaning this, the Jews rejected the real Messiah. But then he says, if another comes in his own name, you will receive him. The Israelites have a history of showing that they are ready to embrace false messiahs. If that false messiah, they think, can offer them peace and safety and prosperity, peace from their enemies. And they're going to do it again when the Antichrist shows up on the scene and offers them peace and prosperity. They're going to jump on his bandwagon. But the real Messiah, and that's what Jesus is talking about here, and the real Messiah, they reject. Read 41 and then 44. Because Jesus says, I do not receive glory from men. Then skip down to verse 44. How can you believe who receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? And so they were just the opposite of Christ in their attitude. He did not care about pleasing men or receiving honor from people. They were just the opposite. The problem with these leaders is that's what they lived for. The problem with these leaders is that's what they wanted. They wanted praise from people more than they wanted praise from God. They wanted to be popular. They wanted to be famous. They wanted to be something special. Just the opposite of humility. You can't be a big shot and be right with God. You just can't have that attitude and be right with God. And that's what they wanted more than to be right with God. But in order to be right with God, you have to approach Him with humility, something that they lacked. You have to approach Him with humility. If you want to be right with God, you have to approach Him as a spiritual beggar with nothing to offer Him. Just asking for mercy. They were not willing to humble themselves. Five. And the great thing about that is the Bible says if you humble yourself before God, He will exalt you. Verse 45. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. It is Moses who accuses you on whom you set your hope. These religious leaders, if you've been with us the last few weeks, they were accusing Jesus falsely of breaking the Sabbath. Well, He could accuse them right back if he wanted to. He could accuse them of breaking the spirit of God's law and also the letter of God's law because they were guilty of breaking both of them. But he's not going to. He says he doesn't have to. I don't have to accuse you, he says. The written word of God already does. 
And that is going to be our judge. The written word of God. They're already guilty. God's word says it. Verse 46. Jesus says, If you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote of me. You know, the Jews used Moses in a twisted way. They used his writings that God inspired him to write in the Old Testament. They twisted them and they used them to denounce Christ. Moses would not be happy to hear that these religious rulers used him to denounce Christ. He would not be happy at all. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is Moses' God. The Lord Jesus Christ is, is Moses' Lord and Savior. And no doubt, friend. The Bible says those who belong to him are friends of God. Moses with Jesus for centuries in heaven before Jesus left heaven to came, come to earth and be born a baby. Moses knows Jesus and Jesus knows Moses. Moses would not be happy to hear that these religious rulers are using him to denounce Christ. But that's what they were trying to do. Verse 47. He says, But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? You know, they claimed to have such high regard for Moses and the scriptures that he wrote. Well, if they won't believe what Moses wrote concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, if they won't believe that, then they sure won't believe what Jesus says about himself. 47, one more time. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And it comes down to this. Do you believe the writings? That's what it always comes down to. Do you believe the writings? Do you believe the written word of God? Do you believe the sacred scriptures? Or do you not? Because if you believe the word of God, then you don't need any other testimony at all concerning who Jesus is. People who reject Christ or downplay his, who he really is are rejecting the Holy Scriptures. And you can show them the Scriptures, but if they have no regard for the Scriptures, they're not going to have any regard for Christ either. It comes down to that. If these Jews would have believed the Bible and respected it the way they should have, they would not be looking for more verification that Jesus is the Son of God. They wouldn't need it. We switch gears, going to chapter 6. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Sea of Galilee, as you probably know, is up north in Israel. And in Jesus' time, there were many cities that were built around this Sea of Galilee. And uh, a lot of times, Jesus used the beach, the beaches in these cities as his church. He did a lot of teaching on the beaches, the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And that's where he is here. Verse 2, And a multitude followed him, because they saw the signs which he did on those who were diseased. I could not help, when I read this, but think of when I was a little child. There was a park in town here. It was called Duck Island. It's still here. It's just called something different. There aren't any ducks there. But back when I was little, there were hundreds of ducks on this island. And people, I was, it was right in my backyard. You would go down there and take a little bread, feed the ducks. And if you were the only human on that island, you could drop a few pieces of bread and a, and a few of the ducks would come by you and pretty soon, hundreds of ducks would be by you. You could walk, no kidding, you could walk all over that island and just drop a piece of bread every now and then. You look behind you and those ducks would be flocking behind you no matter where you went. They were just behind you. And that's what these people are like. These people are like needy ducks following Christ. They follow Him because He cares about them. And they follow Him because He helped them. That's what it's all about. They're looking for, they're looking for that bread. They're looking for that physical handout that He was giving them. Whether it was healing or, as we will see in a few minutes here, literal bread. Verse 3. Jesus went up on the mountain. Or no, he, yeah, Jesus went up on the mountain and there sat down with His disciples. And so Jesus gets away from the crowd. He gets alone with his men. No doubt partly for privacy and just partly for rest. So they're up on this mountain. Verse 4. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Jews would start talking about the Passover about 30 days before it actually arrived. Sort of like most people in Christmas. 
And then when it got to be about 15 days before the Passover, it was really getting close. They would say it's at hand. It's near. So that's where we are right here. Getting close to the Passover. In verse 4, <clears throat> verse 4 it says, Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand. Verse 5, Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a multitude was coming to him, Jesus said to Philip, How are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? I thought of when I was in school and the teacher called on me and I didn't know the answer. That's what it was like for Philip here. I'm, I'm convinced of it. You're in a classroom, the teacher calls on you and you don't have a clue. And you've got to give the answer. He just asked to Philip, you know, there's probably 15 or 20,000 people here. I'll bet you. 5,000 men, you've got to add the women, the children. Got to be 15,000 people. Hey, Philip, how are we going to feed all these people? And he's just sitting there like a child in the classroom who doesn't have the answer, who's been called on. He doesn't have a clue. So he sits there. And then verse 6, it says, This he, Jesus, said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Jesus, like any good teacher, you know, knew the answer to his question. He wasn't asking for information. He was asking to see if the student knew the answer to the question. Verse 7, here's Philip's answer. Philip answered him, 200 denarii, and I believe that's about eight months' wages, would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. And so Philip's answer was, at best I suppose Philip's answer was, I don't know, and at worst is, it's hopeless, Jesus. It probably was somewhere in between, I don't know, and it's hopeless. Now his answer was, if we had eight months' wages worth of food, they all might get a little bite. Or a little, a little crumb. It is possible to become so focused on our problems and our challenges that we forget that we have a God who can do absolutely anything and will always do what needs to be done according to what He knows needs to be done. And that's where Philip is right here. He's so focused on the, the huge challenge ahead of him, he forgot, he forgot who was standing there right in front of him, who he was talking to. This was Almighty God. This was Jesus, who's already done tremendous miracles. Verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? Well, Philip didn't have an answer, so Andrew speaks up. And he says, well, we have five loaves and two fish, but why did I even bring it up? Because it doesn't matter. That won't be enough. And he was right. And Philip, in essence, um, or Andrew, in essence, was saying, we don't have what it takes. And he was right about that. They do not have what it takes. God wants us to know that we do not have what it takes because then we draw closer to Him and we look to Him in prayer and we trust in Him and not in ourselves. Verse 10. Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. A lot of grass would mean springtime in that part of the world and that would go along with the Passover verse 11 Jesus then took the loaves and when he had given thanks he distributed them to those who were seated so also the fish as much as they wanted boy don't miss that 15 maybe 20,000 people fed with the five loaves and the two fish fed not, not just a little but as much as they wanted as much as each, each of them wanted and all they had to work with was the five loaves and the two fish that they gave to Jesus and the lesson for us in this is this when you run into trouble meet those challenges with whatever resources you have when you run into trouble, meet those challenges with whatever resources that God has given you. Even if it's clear 
that it's not adequate, at least present those things to God for His use if He wants to use them. Even if they're inadequate, because Christ will supply what is lacking. Just, in other words, do what they did here. Dedicate whatever you have to the service of Christ. Even if it's so small that you don't even think it's worth mentioning. Just dedicate what you do have to the service of Christ. Use what you have because it's the right thing to do, but, but don't trust in what you have. Trust in Almighty God, not in those things. Verse 12. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over that nothing may be lost. And I always like that verse. Because it reminds me that material possessions are from God. And for that reason, they should not be wasted. No one should say, well, I don't have to take care of this thing that I own. I don't have to take care of this car. You know, I don't have to take care of my house. Or I don't have to take care of whatever it might be. Or I don't have to worry about food. I mean, I could waste it. Because after all, I trust in God and God promises that He will supply. Well, that's not trusting God. That's putting God to the test. It's not faith. That's presumption. And that sort of thing is wrong. And so they gathered up the leftovers and notice who did it. Verse 13. So they, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. A lot of leftovers. We know from other gospel accounts that it was the disciples who picked up the leftovers. The disciples, you know, important men, important positions in the ministry of Christ, but they saw themselves as servants of the people, willing to do whatever Jesus asked them to do, and at least at this point. And the lesson for us here is this. Whatever it may be that God has gifted you to do, be content to do it in service to others. Whatever He has gifted you with, be content to use that gift as a servant to help others. That's the thing that pleases Jesus. Verse 14. When the people saw the sign which He had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. The ancient Jews understood that there was a special prophet that Moses spoke about in Deuteronomy 18. And they, were, they knew that, at least some of them anyway, believed that that prophet was going to be the Messiah. Right now this big crowd believes that Jesus is that prophet that Moses spoke about that would come. And they also believe that He is the Messiah. I know they do because of what follows here pretty quick. Verse 15. Look at this. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. He said, I don't get it. Why did he do that? I mean, somebody might say, this is, this is the Lord's chance. They, they were going to make him king. They were going to anoint him right on the spot, right then and there. Why did he withdraw to the mountain? Golden opportunity. They're going to make him king. Yeah, they were. They were going to make him king. But their idea of a king Messiah was somebody who would meet all their physical needs. Somebody who would you know, give them food and give them health and also deliver them from Rome. This crowd and Jesus knew their heart. This crowd was not interesting, interested in submitting to the Lordship of Christ. That was not on their mind at all. They weren't interested in repentance, making Christ the Lord of their life. So that's not the kind of Messiah that Jesus is. Besides, he's on a mission to die for the sins of the world. He's not going to let anything detract him from that. Verse 16. I like this. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. Now, Jesus and his disciples are up on that mountain. And he sends his men down the mountain ahead of him to the lake. And notice verse 17. It says they got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. 
It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. So Jesus is still up on the mountain. He sends the disciples down to the sea and they wait. And they evidently thought that Jesus was going to join them, but he never showed. And so, and it's getting dark. And so they want to cross the sea before you know, it gets too late. So they hop in the boat and they set sail by themselves. Verse 18. The sea arose because a strong wind was blowing. Well, no doubt when they, it doesn't say, it, but when they first took off, they first set sail, I'm sure it looked safe. The sea must have been calm and they never would have gone out. But it didn't last very long. And I guess that's the way it is on the Sea of Galilee. I've read several things about that, that storms just blow up very quickly on the Sea of Galilee. They come out of nowhere and they could be very rough. And that's exactly what happened here. So now they're in the middle of this sea in the dark in a terrible storm. And there's no Jesus with them. Verse 19. And when they had rowed about two or three miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat. And they were frightened. They were frightened because they didn't know that it was Jesus. I remember talking about this when we went through the other Gospels. They didn't know it was Jesus. And they knew it wasn't a dream because they were all seeing Him, whatever it was. And what they thought it was was a phantom, a water spirit. In other words, a demon in human form coming to get them because that's what they believed back in those days that phantoms, water spirits would come out in the middle of the lake and destroy fishermen's boats at night during storms. So that's what they think is coming toward them, no doubt. No wonder they are in a panic. Verse 20, But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Well, Jesus knew that they were afraid, so he talked to them, and that calmed them down. The lesson from us there is this. God's, God's voice is the thing that comforts his people. It is the word of God that comforts his people. Even during those situations where you have no reason to feel comfortable, you know, other because of the circumstances, but then you hear the voice of God and it just gives peace. And it's great to have good friends who are godly and relatives or whatever that can talk to you when times are tough. But the voice of God is the thing that you need to hear. Prayerfully reading God's word, that settles you down during turbulent times. Verse 21. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. And so this was a miracle. And evidently it was a double miracle. Jesus walking on the water was miracle number one. And then, notice, when Jesus got into the boat, they're at their destination. So somehow, some way, God raptured that boat to the shore as soon as Jesus got into it. Verse 22. On the next day, the people who remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Now these people that are talking here, they are the ones that Jesus multiplied the bread and, and the fish for the night before. They saw what was going on the, the night before. They saw the disciples come down from the mountain and hop into that one boat that was on the shore and cross. But they never saw Jesus come down from the mountain. And so they thought that he was still up there. They spent the night there, I suppose, thinking that pretty soon Christ is going to come down from the mountain and when he does, we will see him if he tries to leave. But they never saw him. Verse 23. It says, However, boats from Tiberias came near the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the people saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. 
Well, they wait and they wait and Jesus never comes down from the mountain, you know. So, evidently they, they checked it out and Jesus was nowhere to be found anywhere. So they figured he must have, I suppose, come down in the middle of the night or something. They got, he got by him and must have found a boat someplace and crossed the, 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 the sea. And they never saw it. But since they didn't see him anywhere around that area, they get into this boat and they cross the sea looking for Jesus. And then they find him in verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? They want to know when Jesus crossed because they didn't see it happen. They didn't see him come down from that mountain. And no doubt they also want to know how he crossed since there were no other boats there except for the one that the apostles crossed over. How did you, how did you, when did you come here? How did you come here? See, this would be another golden opportunity for Jesus to promote his miracles if he wanted to. There's a great chance for him to do that right here. How did you get over here? Many people, many people today would, would if they were Jesus, they would say, well, I walked on water. That's how I got here. Man, you should have saw me. It was really something. I walked on this water. But Jesus didn't even mention that miracle. He just did not promote his miracles at all. He downplayed them. Didn't even mention it. And he didn't answer their question either. Not that one, because they asked when he got there. In verse 26, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. He got right down to the heart of the issue because he knew what was on their mind. He cut through all the surface garbage and he got right down to what they were thinking. Jesus created free food for them the night before. And now since it's time for breakfast, and they are no doubt hungry, they're coming to look for Jesus. They want, they want breakfast. Reminds me of the fact that many people seek Jesus for what, they can, for what He can give them in this world. But very few people, even people who call themselves Christians, very few people seek Jesus just because of who He is. Think about it. Think about how that would make you feel, by the way. If people only hung out with you, talked to you, wanted to be around you, because you could give them something, that would not make you feel very good. And nobody ever hung around you simply because they liked you or they enjoyed your company. Same thing happening right here. They didn't come to Jesus because He was Jesus. They came to Him because He could feed them. Many, many people pray, spend time with Christ because of what He can give them in this world. Not just spending time enjoying His company because of who He is. 27. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on Him has God the Father set His seal. Jesus says, do not labor for the food that perishes. These people, like many people, work for the food that perishes. And what that is talking about is this. Most people put most of their time and energy into getting things that will satisfy them, satisfy their present body, be useful for this present world and satisfy their physical body. Most people put most of their energy into working for that sort of thing. Jesus is saying not that all of that is wrong, but what he is saying here is that that sort of thing is not as important as working for those things that will benefit your immortal soul and your life in eternity. And so that's why he says, do not labor for the food which perishes, 
but for the food that endures to eternal life. Verse 28, And they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? In other words, boy, this is an important question. What kind of, what kind of works does God approve of? That's their question to Jesus. Their question is, what do we have to do, in other words, to get on the good side of God? That is an important question, right? What do we have to do to get on the good side of God, to please God? Important question, important answer. Verse 29, Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him who He has sent. Nothing that anyone can do is more pleasing to God than for them to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. You want to be pleasing to God. That's where it starts. This is the work of God. Believe on Him who has been sent. And of course, if you truly believe, if somebody truly believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that's going to lead to repentance. That's going to lead to making Jesus Lord and Savior in their life because faith without works is dead and if you really believe something it's going to lead to action otherwise it's unbelief so if somebody wants to please God Jesus has the answer right here begin with believing that Jesus is God Jesus is God's Son and He is the only Savior verse 30 and that's the only thing that can get anybody into the kingdom of heaven that faith 30 so they said to him then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? You know, they ought to come right out and say what they're thinking instead of trying to cover it with give us a sign so that we know that you are who you say you are. They ought to come out right, come right out and say what they are thinking because what they are thinking is we are hungry. We are hungry, make us breakfast, and then we will say that we believe in you. At least until lunch. And then we will ask for another sign to verify that you are who you say you are. Because that's what's on their mind. I'll tell you what though, if Jesus feeding 15,000 people with that little lunch the night before it doesn't convince them that of His unlimited power and doesn't convince them of His unlimited goodness, then another meal won't do it. Nothing will do it. 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. In other words, Jesus, look at these people. In other words, they're saying, Jesus, you fed us one meal last night and, and that was nice and everything. But you know, the Israelites, they got 40 years worth of food when they traveled in the wilderness in Moses' day. Translation, we want breakfast, Jesus. They are thanking food. That is it. Verse 32. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Jesus got to straighten their minds out concerning this manna that they're talking about. A couple of things about that bread. First, Moses isn't the one who gave it to the Israelites. God did. And second, Jesus says that, that bread that they ate for those 40 years, that was not the true bread. It was just a poor shadow of the true bread. Somebody says, well, what is the true bread that Jesus is talking about? He defines it in verse 33. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I bet you some of your translations say correctly, the bread of God is He who comes down. The bread of God is He. The bread of God is a person. It's a He. It's not, a, it's not a thing. And so, of course, the bread of God that comes down from heaven, Jesus is talking about Himself. And Jesus says, that bread that comes down from heaven, that true bread that I want to offer you, that comes down from heaven, just like the manna did, and it gives life, but not just for the body, like the manna did. This true bread gives body, or gives life for the soul as well. And it's for the whole world, Jesus said, not just for the Israelites. That manna was just for the Israelites. And so that bread that Jesus is talking about here is a lot better than the manna that the Israelites were fed with. Verse 34. 
They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. See, they're still thinking about literal bread. They're thinking literal bread here. They're thinking, man, we're, we're going to get more than what we bargained for. We came here looking for Jesus, trying to find breakfast, and he's evidently going to give us some kind of super bread. This is going to be great. So they say, they say give us this bread, Lord. I'll close with verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. In other words, if you repent and you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, He satisfies. He's satisfied. And no one should come to Christ primarily to be satisfied. When a person comes to Christ, I know I've said this in the past, but when a person comes to Christ, you need to come to Christ knowing that you're a sinner in need of eternal life, in need of God's mercy and the salvation that Jesus provides. And when somebody comes to Christ with that attitude, knowing that they need a Savior from hell and a Savior from sin, then when they live for Him, they surrender to His Lordship, the peace and the satisfaction comes as a byproduct of that. And so Jesus is saying, those who receive Him as Lord and Savior, those who live for Him, will experience satisfaction now and eternal happiness as well. And so, I'll just leave you with this, that our relationship with Christ, um, and as a result, our trust in Christ, which comes from living for Him and drawing close to Him, that is really, that provides the solution for all worries. That's what gives you peace. That's what gives you satisfaction. But those things are a byproduct of receiving Christ as Lord and Savior from your sin. Jesus fills our souls with a hope that is